999ers risk their lives every day keeping us safe. My heart was racing, but you just do it because you're a police officer. But all too often, they're abused and attacked. I have been punched, kicked, spat at, sworn at. I think most of us have. These personal attacks on police, firefighters and paramedics are at an all-time high. I could feel the blood running through my shirt. He grabbed me around the throat with both his hands. Leaving them traumatised and unable to work. It's then left me questioning, is this the job that I want to carry on with? But while the violent criminals responsible are hunted down and brought to justice, our protectors fight to get well and back on the job. I'm not going to get beaten by somebody deciding they're going to try and hurt me. Ready to face the next critical incident. Stand still! Please pretend to show yourself! Coming up... When a dam is on the verge of collapse, emergency services are called in to save a town. Millions of gallons pouring down the spillway. There is a danger to life. And one officer puts himself in the ultimate danger. The highest risk job of the day was definitely being on the wall itself. You don't go up there thinking that the worst is going to happen. When he's assaulted by a patient, an emergency medical technician focuses on his community work to help him cope. In this job, we see happy times, we see heartbreaking times. It's very important to have a stress release. And as a gang of knife-wielding robbers are pursued by the police, they live stream the event. They are filming from the uh, inside of the vehicle. And help put themselves behind bars. When we first heard that the front passenger was recording this on his phone, I didn't genuinely believe it because I didn't think anyone would be that silly to do that. Oh, help us block off the fence, I beg, I beg you. Whaley Bridge is a small town in the High Peak District of Derbyshire, best known for its scenic walks and wildlife until the community of around 6,500 people became the subject of a national news story on the 1st of August, 2019. If the wall collapses, it could swamp the town centre below. There is a danger to life. It's a race against time and the elements. Toddbrook Reservoir sits just above the town of Whaley Bridge, and after severe flooding, the dam was on the brink of collapse. In the days leading up to the incident, extreme weather conditions across the country had caused severe damage to roads and properties. But the town of Whaley Bridge was in imminent danger. We had another, more intense weather event that started to bring more water into what was already a full reservoir. Todbrook Dam has taken a battering from days of torrential rain. Giant slabs of concrete have been dislodged from the spillway. The reservoir holds 300 million gallons of water and is a mile long. That water is being held back now by a structurally weakened dam. Daniel Greenhouse, a director at the Canal and River Trust, is involved in caring for the reservoir. The Todbrook Reservoir is a large reservoir and its capacity is well over a billion litres of water. This was yesterday evening, millions of gallons pouring down the spillway as the reservoir overflowed. The reservoir was designed to take water levels well in excess of what we saw, but they were extreme weather events. The fear is that more rain could undermine it and the reservoir could burst through. Emergency services needed to prevent 1.2 million tonnes of water from engulfing the homes, schools and businesses of Whaley Bridge. We needed to stop the water coming in and divert it around the reservoir. We needed to get the water out of the reservoir as quickly as possible. And we needed to protect and then repair the damaged section of this auxiliary spillway. It was all-time critical. It all needed doing yesterday, but the only thing we could do immediately was to sandbag the, uh, the, the weir to stop flows going over the, the top and making the erosion hull any uh, larger. 1,500 people live downstream. I would suggest at least half of those would have been in direct uh, fire from any uh, major breach. So um, breaches aren't just river floods. 
you know, they're more like tsunamis, so, yeah, the, the town would have been devastated. Multi-agencies are called to the incident, including the Derbyshire Police Task Force. And at 57, PC Jeff Marshall is the longest serving member. It's predominantly a search team. It's what some forces call TSG, so tactical support group. We do working at heights, power tools, but we work on all the bigger jobs throughout the force. Jeff got the call on his day off and headed straight to work. The whole thing was urgent. You know, we got to get up there as soon as possible, really. The reality of it was nobody knew what we were going to. We parked up and you could see the hole in the dam. You couldn't miss the damage, it was big. There was a whole patch missing. It was really obvious from the minute you walked up that this was potentially a really, really serious incident. That's a, a, a large dam wall. You know there's a lot of water behind it. And then going into the command room and being told, actually, this has got potential to go any time. Meanwhile, police are evacuating 1,500 residents from their homes and businesses in the face of a catastrophic event, allowing the mere minutes to grab essentials and get out of the town. This might be it. I know colleagues who were travelling up to go and do the evacuation who rang loved ones and said goodbye to them as they were travelling up. That's what they thought they were going to. There were just swarms of police just blue lighting into the um, town. The situation had become critical. We were feared, I suppose. Um, we were just glad that we could quickly get out. Everybody was frightened. We were all very unsure what was going on. It was scary. If there was any chance of saving this dam, we had to get sandbags onto the wall. It was starting to rain, and we got to prevent any more water coming over that front. But what I also realised was the, the risks involved in being down on the dam wall, or even just on the top doing the sandbagging, were absolutely enormous. Um, there was a high probability that we weren't actually going to come off that dam wall. I'm staying on the dam wall, I'm going to do some sandbagging. But to instruct others to do that, that wasn't fair. Because if we'd seen any indication that the, the dam was starting to fail, we stood perhaps a small probability of running off the dam quick enough before the whole lot collapsed. We were told it would just collapse underneath us. You get a little warning and then it would just go. Making that decision that I was even going to ask the staff to be there was the biggest decision I've made in 26 years of police service. The inspector turned up and just told us the task we'd been asked to do. He then said he needed volunteers, nobody was going to be forced into anything. And, and that's where it was sort of left. Everybody volunteered. By far the highest risk job was being down on the dam wall because there was no way that anybody there would have time to get up and come again. That was like, right guys, I'm only putting one on that wall. Um, it's a really high risk situation. I need a volunteer. Um, and about six hands went up, but when I turned round, Jeff being Jeff had already tied himself into the rope. There was like, that's me, boss, I'm going, um, which just about sums the bloke up, really. <laughs> I'm never one to shy away from a, a situation, um, and I push myself forward. I'm one of the, well, I am the oldest and longest serving on the team, but it was more or less, look, I'm going to go down. I knew I could do the job. You don't go up there thinking that the worst is going to happen, but you're doing the right thing. As another bout of torrential rain batters the dam, Jeff and the team needed to get to work immediately. We only had about two to three metres of earth fill left before the water actually breached through. The hole had appeared in the last 24 hours, and uh, well, when I was stood there with Jeff, Looking down, you could still see water and material being washed down, so the hole was getting bigger as we, uh, as we stood on the crest bridge. 50% of the town had not been evacuated, uh, and the risk rate, if we didn't do it, you know, those 50% would be in, uh, in trouble. A lot of people would have died. A lot of people. So, get it done, get sorted, get up, get off. 
and at that point we started passing bags down. As many as we could, as quickly as we could. It's a race against time and the elements. They need to draw down water to reduce the risk. Something which has always been seen as a local attraction and beauty spot suddenly poses a real mortal danger. With over 900 sandbags to get into position, a ladder was set up at either end of the dam wall as an escape route should the worst happen, which was a very real possibility. There is no doubt from what the engineers had told me that we would get very, very little warning. Uh, we were told to look out for a telltale sign of either a whirlpool on one on the water side or a slight spurt coming out on the dam side. And within seconds, maybe if we were lucky, minutes, that the whole lot would collapse underneath us. So we did have spotters looking for those signs, but certainly it was a very, very tense atmosphere. It was professional, it was heads down, and it was grafting as hard as we could to get those sandbags down. An hour into the mission, one of the sergeants spots a spurt of water on the dam side and raises the alarm. I remember him just shouting, get off the bridge. Um, and it, literally, it was everybody was repeating, get off the bridge. The engineer said to me, just run because it may just collapse from under you. So my plan was just to aim for the ladder and go as quick as I possibly could. Jeff went to a different ladder to the ladder I was expecting him to go up. So, yeah, he ran along and I remember him stopping and getting caught by the rope. The ladder in my eye line was straight ahead and my route would have been straight up and over. Um, that's, that was my plan. As soon as I saw the ladder, that's where I was going but I couldn't get the rope off my back, which was a bigger problem. Later, with fears the dam may burst any second, Jeff realises this could be the end of the line. At that point, I thought I could be in trouble because I'd been told that the, the concrete slab could just drop away and I'd have gone. And RAF Chinooks are added to the rescue mission to ensure the safety of Whaley Bridge. This is a battle which has been waged from the air, across the ground and in the water. I'm a Bally Island boy. Born and bred on Bally Island in the days of when Butlins was here, when Bally Island was booming at its heyday, um, the fairground, the beach, Gavin and Stacey. I love it. We're just spoiled, really. Dean loves nothing more than giving back to his beloved hometown. I voluntarily sing around all the local uh, residential and nursing homes for the elderly people. Anything to do with the community and helping raise money for different different charities, I, I, I just love it. It's close to my heart. I'm a member of the HM Coast Guard team at Barry Island, which is a search and rescue team. Somebody want to grab the dump sheet? We do medical evacuations, we do rope rescues, lost and missing persons. Um, very, very busy. Very, very busy team. And as if he's not busy enough, Dean has been a full-time emergency medical technician with the Welsh Ambulance Service for over 20 years. The main reason I do the job is to be caring and compassionate um, and giving back to the community that I live in. Unfortunately, though, being a frontline emergency worker also means that Dean sometimes sees the darker side of his community. The most difficult thing about the job is it can be quite challenging when you arrive at scene and you're met with a hostile situation. Knife crimes in areas is on the air. Um, alcohol and drug intake is on the air. As an ambulance service, we are the ones who you would think people wouldn't want to be aggressive against or violent against because we're there to help people. We take people to a, a place of safety, a place of care and a place of treatment. It, and it, it just breaks your heart, really, to do a job that you do, to, to be, come to work, because nobody should come to work, whatever their job may be, 
to feel intimidated, bullied, or even assaulted by, by anybody. Although Dean had endured relentless verbal abuse over the years, he'd never been physically assaulted until one shift in July 2015. We received a call at 4 o'clock in the morning to a male unconscious in Cardiff. We arrived at scene. We noticed that it was a communal block of flats. We were met by a female at the door. The lady said to us that the gentleman was on the floor in a garden area of the communal block of flats. When we got into the communal area, we, we went through one set of doors. They shut behind us. We then had to go in through another set of doors into a, a communal garden area where we sighted a male laying on the floor. So to picture the one door shut behind us, the second door shut behind us, we were then, in a way, locked within this garden. So as we were assessing the male, we could see that his conscious level was reduced. We could smell alcohol. We wasn't aware at the time that the gentleman was intoxicated, but we could smell alcohol. There was no indication of there being any situation, a hostile situation. There was no, no evidence of any altercations had gone on prior to us arriving on scene. When we went to move the patient off the floor onto the caddy chair, he was like a wild banshee. He just went absolutely ballistic. Very, very verbally abusive, violently aggressive, he was lashing out, throwing punches. Unfortunately, I took the consequence of the punches to the left side of my forehead. He picked up the caddy chair and he threw the caddy chair. The neighbour with the key for the communal door had disappeared, meaning Dean and his colleague were locked in with their attacker. When we looked and noticed that the lady had moved away from the door, we knew that there was no way out for us. She was our only escape route. So we were trapped within this garden area. We did fear for our lives. You know, I'm a big, big man, I'm six foot three, uh, but this man was bigger than me, much bigger than me. There was just no stopping him. We got a panic button on our radios, so we pushed the panic button on the radio. And that, once you push that, it opens the airways for 15 seconds. And we just shouted, we need the police, we need the police. For somebody who was at one minute unconscious, laying on the floor, to the next minute like a raging bull, he was very, very strong. We didn't know if he was carrying a weapon, did he have anything on him? You know, anything could have happened. So it was a, a worrying situation that we were in. Dean had been repeatedly punched in the left side of his face. But thankfully, the police arrived after a few minutes. It was like a, a, a pressure release, because we knew then that our backup was there. Our lifesaver was there, actually. There was just no way out for us. The gentleman then started becoming violent and aggressive to the police. They managed to anchor him, and it took six police officers to put the gentleman in the back of the police van. Once his attacker was arrested and Dean was safe, he realised the extent of his injuries. I felt pain straight away, and I could feel, feel my left eye was swelling straight away. Dean was then taken to hospital to have his injuries assessed. After the x-rays being done and being seen by the doctor, they wasn't sure whether I had a fractured eye socket or cheekbone, so I had to go back the following day for further x-rays. It was a nasty surprise for Dean's family when he arrived home with a black eye, especially for his daughter, Evie, who was nine at the time. For her to see her dad with, with a swollen black eye it isn't very nice for her, because you know, even, even Evie said, well, you go to work to help people, Daddy, not, not to fight with people. So how do you explain to a, a nine-year-old who is going to be growing up in the community that these things happen in life? It was quite upsetting, knowing that someone had hurt my dad when he was just trying to help. But now that I'm older, I understand that it's a lot more serious than I thought it was. But, yeah, it is quite scary. 
I was in a lot of pain for, for, for some time, really. The swelling kept coming out, the bruising was coming out. I was experiencing headaches, blurred vision in, in the left eye. And I did think about it every day. I, I, you have flashbacks, you think, why, why me? And when I returned back to work, it just felt deflated, it just felt, do I really want to continue to do this job? Do it, do it, it's not what I signed up to do the job for. The Welsh Ambulance Service provides support to staff who, like Dean, are victims of assaults just for doing their jobs. Former paramedic Dylan Parry is now the Trust's lead for violence and aggression. So I support the staff who are victims of violence and aggression incidents uh, that are reported to the Trust. Um, I, I check on their well-being and their welfare and I also work with the police and the courts uh, to see that the offender is uh, made accountable for their actions. We go through it plenty of times before we actually get to court. Um, the need for my role is that there is a definite increase in these incidents, certainly an increase in the reporting. We cannot underestimate the impact that has on the individuals on the wrong end of such incidents. You also have to think about their families and what they must be going through knowing their loved ones are out doing the job they love, helping people, but ultimately becomes victims of crime. There is also another side to it in terms of impacting the service we're able to provide, because if our staff are unable to work because of their injuries or because of the incident, then that impacts our ability to deliver a service to the patients that are waiting for us. Yeah, no worries, I'll see you on Tuesday. I've been on the front line myself, it's, it's, you know, it's a great place to work, but it's a hard place to work um, without all of this um, violence. It kind of just makes me a bit more determined to support them and, you know, get a bit of justice for them. At court, Dean's attacker was convicted of assault by beating and was sentenced to 12 months in prison. I would say since that incident, and more so with verbal violent aggression coming towards emergency staff, it do make you have your guard up a little bit and make you a little bit, little bit more wiser of the, the situations that you're dealing with and, and the approach of situations. When you've had accidents... Evie is now 14 and more aware of the dangers of her dad's job. It is quite, like, scary to think about. Now that I'm on social media, I see a lot of things on there about incidents that happen and like um, assaults and that type of thing. And I see a lot on the news as well because there's uh, a lot of people talk about it on the news. So it is quite worrying when my dad's involved in that sort of job. I'm always cautious that I've come to work and, and Evie's worrying about me. I'll speak to her several times on the phone during a shift and she'll always say to me, are you okay and how's your day going? Always. She always says to me, stay safe, be careful. She understands that I don't come to work to be abused. I love him a lot, um, more than he knows. But um, I am really proud of him because he does help people all the time. And even outside of his job as well, he will help anyone. And he tries to understand their situation. And as Dean is a man of action, he's found countless ways to take his mind off the pressures of work. In this job, we see happy times, we see sad times, we see heart heartbreaking times. It's very important to have a stress release. It's one of those jobs where you take it home with you and it'll just burn you out. So you do need to have something else to do outside of this job. It's a must. Oh, cracking. <laughs> oh. I thought it was time for a lifetime change, so I went out for a local, local stroll. Bumped into Asia. We had a workout for the day. <laughs> what turned out to be a casual stroll turned into full on fitness training. Yeah. Asia said that she was happy to come and train with me, being a, a former Wales international football player and also playing for the Arsenal ladies football team as well. Um, and from there on, it's just gone and progressed. Dean is absolutely brilliant to train with. He, well, usually listens to uh, everything I say. But... <laughs> When we're out exercising, it does absolutely wonders. It's such a stress release. We just have the best laugh ever.
The role of a police officer is an unpredictable one, and they never know what a shift might bring. In the West Midlands, dash cam from a PC's patrol car shows the moment two drug dealers sped down the hard shoulder to avoid queuing, but unwittingly undertook the police car. Really? On seeing the blue lights, they indicated as if they were pulling over, but then sped off and the patrol car gave chase. is now 8.34 in towards Warsaw. It is a uh, speed of uh, 9.0 in a posted uh, 3.0 limit. It is a dual carriageway. Traffic is light. It's just mounted a curb, so I suspect it may have some damage. And the vehicle is stunned by 8.34 Warsaw Road. He is contravening a keep left bollard canal. Can I have any tactical units towards me, please? The suspect's car weaved between traffic and jumped several red lights. The car drove into a park and one man jumped out clutching a bag, which was full of drugs. Well, um, it's a uh, standby. I've got one out on foot. It is off-road. It's um, one out and running. The driver's still in the vehicle. We're onto grassland. Uh, passenger, I see one green top, blue trousers, and the vehicle is now returning to the road. In a bid to evade the police car, the driver did a lap of a pub car park. Yeah, okay, we're into the Toby car, very um, Risk is still medium, and we're into the car park. We go back out near the side where I am stuck on the road. But realising the patrol car is still close behind... Okay, well, I'm speed has significantly reduced now. He gives himself up. On the Broadway North, uh, outside 112, vehicle's pulling over now, it's own accord, stand by. The rucksack was found in a bush containing cocaine valued at around half a million pounds. The driver pleaded guilty to dangerous driving and possessing a controlled drug of Class A with intent. He was jailed for seven years. The passenger, who was caught trying to escape in a taxi, pleaded guilty to possessing a controlled drug of Class A with intent and was jailed for six years. Still to come, as a nation watches on, the emergency mission is a success. We were proud of what we'd done. And the Whaley Bridge residents finally return home. We cannot thank them enough for saving our town. And a detective constable is determined to bring a gang of robbers to justice after they live stream their crimes. They don't care about the wider public, the danger that it imposed. Back in Derbyshire, PC Jeff Marshall and his crewmates are trying to save the town of Whaley Bridge by stacking sandbags after severe flooding leaves Toddbrook Dam on the brink of collapse, when they suddenly get a warning to get off the bridge, as it could give way any second. Jeff went to a different ladder to the ladder I was expecting him to go up. So, yeah, he ran along and I remember him stopping and getting caught by the rope. At that point, I thought I could be in trouble. There was a ladder a lot closer. So I turned around, better switch on, get back to the other ladder. And then one of the lads was shouting me back at the top and they just pulled me over and we, we got off. If the concrete had dropped away, I would have gone. Just a few minutes ago, uh, there were a lot of people standing on that walkway. They have all just been rushed off the walkway. It appears all it was was a piece of mud that had just got a little bit of water behind that had just obviously had water building up and had just washed away. But it was uh, that was certainly a very, very tense, tense few seconds. The water would have come through. The town would have been just completely covered in mud. And the water would have carried on going. There could have been masses of casualties, thousands of deaths. As soon as they get the all clear, 
Jeff is back on the dam as the team continue their dangerous mission. I remember about halfway through offering to swap him out and somebody else coming in, because bear in mind, we were lowering sandbags down to him above his head. He was taking them down and then placing them. And I'll always remember him just saying to me, boss, it's shoulders day. This is just a shoulders workout. So yeah, I've always had confidence that he'd be able to do the job. You've got some really good people on top passing the bags down and that took as much effort. It was hard work. It was really hard work. For almost two hours, officers and mountain rescue volunteers worked relentlessly until they diverted the water flow away from the erosion hole. Nearly 1,000 sandbags later, the emergency operation had saved the town of Whaley Bridge from being wiped out. Uh, the mood was great because we were told that had we not done it, then the dam would have gone. We were proud of what we'd done. The whole nation had been watching the scenes at the dam unfold. All apart from Jeff's wife, Jennifer, until she returned home from a 10-hour shift as a support worker at the local hospital and saw the news. When I actually saw what he was doing, you know, I saw him on the bridge. I was distraught, if I'm honest. I was proud. I was very proud, but initially I was just really shocked. You know, when I thought he could have actually died today, and it just sort of opened your eyes that your life can just change in an instant. He's very selfless. He is courageous. He'll, he'll take on any task set before him without hesitation. You know, he'll do, the, he'll do something and then think about the consequences afterwards. And that's, that's just typical of Jeff. Emergency workers continue working tirelessly for days, pumping water out of the reservoir and plugging the gaping hole in the dam. And on the 7th of August, six days after being evacuated, it was declared safe enough for the Whaley Bridge residents to return home. That was just the best. That was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant seeing them go back. This is a battle which has been waged from the air, across the ground and in the water. There was a sense of relief. There was elation to say, you're safe to go back to your house. You know, for people that thought they could have lost everything. It's great. Really, it's hard to explain. That was probably the best bit. Yeah. The rescue team's absolutely amazing. And even the guys that, did, that brought the Chinook and helped secure the dam, working 24 seven, they were just constantly there. And um, we couldn't thank them enough for what they did to save our village, really. I cannot find any words to thank the emergency services, the volunteers, mountain rescue teams, um, the operation that they pulled together in that very short time they had to do it. It was just incredible, absolutely incredible. As Jeff returns to the reservoir today, it's a very different scene to the one in August 2019. It's strange to be back. The whole slipway is different. Everything was so busy at the time. It was just manic, people everywhere, um, all trying to resolve a major problem, I suppose. It's just nice to see life's back to normal. That makes you proud. You know, things could have been so, so different, but they're not, and that's a good thing. Inspector Philip Booth also has the utmost pride and respect for the actions of his task force team that day. I don't believe any of them at any point in their service will have put their life on the line in the way they did that day. And in October 2020, Jeff's actions were recognised when he was named a regional winner at the Police Federation Bravery Awards. It's unbelievable. It's something you never, ever expect. Everyone give it up for Jeff Marshall. I'm just really, really pleased for him um, because there's no doubt that whilst we're all at risk, Jeff 
Jeff had clearly made the decision that whatever happened that day, he was going to be the one on that wall. Bravery don't come into it. That was just a decision of self-sacrifice. Certainly thank God that we did come off safe and that there wasn't an incident at Whaley Bridge. That nobody died. We were asked to do it, and we did it. And we'll do it again. The live streaming of crimes on social media is a rapidly increasing phenomenon. Boys, there's, there's one, there's two, there's three. Tech-savvy criminals can't resist the buzz of broadcasting their offences, however shaky the footage might be, in the hope of likes and live feedback from their online peers. Search him. Serious crimes which put the public at risk are often referred to a police criminal investigations department. Kelly Tyndall is a detective constable for North Kent Police. The role of a detective constable is, first of all, securing all the evidence of any serious complex crime that comes in, making sure all lines of inquiry are investigated, whether it points towards or away from the defence, and then we will continue that investigation all the way until um, court to secure a conviction. In January 2021, in Dartford, a group of machete-wielding robbers are live-streaming as they're on a high-speed car chase with the police in Kent. Kelly became the investigating officer in charge of the case. A group of three males met our victim in Knights Manaway in Dartford in a residential area. Um, they had an exchange and as a result, one of the males produced a machete from his trousers, um, pointed it at our victim and demanded his money, his phone and anything else he had. Um, that caused our victim to run away from them and run to his car where his partner was actually sat in. They've then grabbed him, threw him onto the floor, kicked him um, and grabbed this £20 that the victim has held out and said, this is all I have. Um, he's then tried to get into the car um, and they've stopped him. They've then gone round to the driver's side where his girlfriend was sat at um, and she only had the car keys on her. Um, and the male with the machete then pointed at her and said, give me the car keys or this is going in you. So it was a very frightening time for both of the victims. So they carried out a robbery at night point. Uh, got into a car and got away, but the police were called and we got there incredibly quickly, uh, minutes after the offence, found the car and tried to stop the car. Uh, but it uh, drove off at massive, incredible speeds. So we were in pursuit of it now. So you can now imagine many, many, many members of the public outside of the robbery now at risk to serious violence from uh, these individuals uh, in this car. Oh, my God. Sir, sir. When we first heard that the front passenger was recording this on his phone, I didn't genuinely believe it because I didn't think anyone would be that silly to, to do that. I also thought it was very brazen to live stream it to everyone. And they're urging friends to help them escape. Please help, I'm in your car. Help us block off the fence. I beg, I beg you, I beg you. We're going to die today. He's talking to his friends and he says, get them to block this road. He's actively trying to make the police's job more difficult. Uh, they're throwing stuff out of the car, we're practicing crazy. Officers are right behind the offenders. He's filming them. Uh, they are filming from the uh, inside of the vehicle. We're now parallel with the services at Cobham. They then box them in to bring the pursuit to a safe conclusion. We've got three team back cars. Oh, it was a, an immediate call for police and assistance. We got there incredibly quickly, 
and we were able to apprehend the offenders for this crime type in a really timely, efficient way. Probably textbook, textbook policing response to a violent knife point robbery. All three men in the car were arrested and brought to custody. You're under arrest. Kelly then started her investigation. And without realizing it, the suspects had provided the prosecution with damning evidence. We did download all the phones for the defendants in this case, um, and that helped us at court. One of the defendant's phones pinged at the scene, so they put him at the scene. And then, as the pursuit happened, um, we could plot his movements until he was stopped on the A2. Initially, he was saying that he wasn't in the car, but we could put him in the car because it was his phone, not only at the scene of when the offence happened, so he was there, also the whole journey and the pursuit until the car was stopped and he was arrested. It showed all of the defendants in the car and it really did portray in court, you know, a really bad attitude amongst them that they don't care about the wider public, the danger that it imposed. It was very impactive to the court, definitely. The man who filmed the chase admitted robbery and was sentenced to two years and eight months in prison. The driver admitted dangerous driving and was sentenced to four months in prison, suspended for a year. He was given 150 hours of unpaid work and banned from driving for 18 months. The passenger admitted two counts of robbery and possessing an offensive weapon and received three years and two months in prison. An accomplice in the robbery was sentenced to two years and four months imprisonment. Kelly made sure that those people have gone to jail, which in my view is where they deserve to be. They don't deserve to be on the street, they deserve to be in prison and serve time for their uh, violent, violent uh, offending. Kelly has kept the public safer as a result of her ability and her desire to do everything she could to present a brilliant case at court, and she did. As a detective constable, we always want to get the maximum punishment for the crime that they've committed because they have such an impact upon the victim, the community and the witnesses that are involved in this case. I do think the sentences reflect on their behaviour and I do think that is a good deterrent. You know, they have to serve a custodial sentence, they have a criminal conviction and when we get that outcome for a victim and their family, there is an overwhelming sense of relief that it's over for that family, but also satisfaction that actually there is a punishment to their actions. You're under arrest! 